Hi, how are you? We're going to talk about an event uh, that happened in 1973. There was two guys, Roger Chapman and Roger Mallinson, were working in a mini sub called Pisces 3. They were uh, helping to bury a, uh, a transatlantic cable that ran um, about 150 miles off Cork in the Atlantic. Um, they were working eight hour shifts in this mini sub. On this particular occasion, they were being hauled to the surface and as they broke the surface the tow rope snagged the after hatch which contained um, an area for machinery it was separate to the sphere that the crew were in and this flooded flooded with a ton of water they crash dived basically backwards to the extent of the tow rope which was a, a nylon rope that eventually broke and they tumbled to the seafloor. So we're going to talk about that. Just uh, as a bit of background, we're going to talk about transatlantic cables as well because um, that, that's quite a very interesting story. Trust me. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, a lot of Irish people, a lot of people in the British Isles generally, I think, uh, have this idea that uh, if you go due west from here, you'll get to New York. Um, you'd be surprised at the amount of people who think that's true. Um, it's nonsense, of course. Um, New York is on a level with sort of the lower part of Spain, southern Spain. Um, we're actually much further up. If it wasn't for the Gulf Stream, we'd have a horrendous uh, climate here because the northern part of Ireland is on the same latitude as the southern part of Alaska, believe it or not. Um, if you go due west from here you get to Newfoundland and uh, the shortest crossing of the Atlantic um, would be from Ireland to Newfoundland. Uh, when ships were carrying messages um, and the telegraph was in play on the land they could gain a lot of time with the message by picking it up at say Kerry or Cork and depositing it then when they get to Newfoundland or Nova Scotia and having them telegraph it on from there. Um, they could save a couple of days, two or three days either end doing that. Um, so ships would do that routinely, carrying messages across the Atlantic. As soon as they made landfall in, in the southwest, southwest corner of Ireland, they'd get their messages ashore and they'd be telegraphed on around the world. The telegraph had transformed things um, and it was really simple. Uh, all you needed was one copper wire. It didn't even need to be insulated. All it needed to be insulated was where it was being held up by poles at the at those suspension points. Um, can't do that under the ocean. So the, the idea of covering large distances underwater with telegraph cable wasn't really faced up to for a long time. There were commercial forces driving this, of course. Um, things like the, the price of cotton was key. To be able to get that or stay in touch with that was very important for people in the Americas. Um, uh, wars and um, Britain needed to get troops from Canada maybe for a war or get supplies all these things the instant uh, communication would have had a huge effect so it was decided to attempt a transatlantic cable um, it's a commercial operation there was a guy called uh, Cyrus Field he was an American entrepreneur he had got um, done a cable across he was working on the cable between Nova Scotia Newfoundland so that messages that were brought ashore at Newfoundland could be telegraphed instantly to, to New York um, and he decided that if he's doing that if he's bridging that gap why not go the whole hog and go across to Europe so Newfoundland to Ireland was the shortest route if you look it might make sense on the map but if you look at any of the grand the great circles great circle routes that aircraft fly and um, covers that same that same bit of sea um, it, we're talking about 16, 1,600 miles. Um, there, was, there had been a survey done of the ocean floor and they had discovered what was almost like a, a plateau that, that suited just along that stretch as well. So the plan was to make some cable, deposit it on the ocean floor, transit messages from one side to the other. They went ahead, they organised ships, um, by the way, Western Union were trying to link 
America and Europe the other way, going from Alaska to Siberia. So they didn't think it was possible to do the ocean. But Field raised a lot of investors, got the American government, the British government on board, um, got, the, uh, the, got land, got uh, equipment, uh, and ships were lent to him to the operation to try and do this. Laying a cable under the sea was a problem because obviously you're laying it in water. So one of the things that enabled this was the development of a material called gutta perca. Some people call it gutta percha. I believe perca is probably more correct. Gutta perca is a naturally occurring plastic. It's not quite like rubber. It's from Malaysia. It's not quite like rubber and you don't need to vulcanize it to make it usable. Um, you, can, you can heat it, form it. When it cools, it'll stay that shape. Um, it was used for all kinds of things, walking sticks, ornaments, picture frames. Um, they had developed a way of making tubes out of it and using apparently using machines they used to make pasta and they adapted them I believe and they could make tubes like speaking tubes from mines was one thing and it dawned on somebody then that you could make this as an insulator for cable so that was what was used this this naturally occurring substance called gutta perca so they put together this operation the first few attempts to lay cables failed. Finally, um, HMS Agamemnon and USS Niagara. Um, they met in the middle of the ocean. They had a load of cable each. They spliced it together, dumped it in the sea and laid it out behind them as the two ships separated and went. The HMS Agamemnon heading east towards Ireland, HMS or uh, USS Niagara heading west. Um, and after the first two attempts had failed, as I said, these two, they pulled it off, they got a cable ashore each end and changed the world. Suddenly, Europe was instantly in touch with America. There was a message sent from the Queen Victoria to the President and back again. And uh, there, was, there was massive uh, partying. There was a 100-gun salute in New York. There was fireworks. They... Uh, they even burnt down the uh, town hall in New York with the fireworks, I think. Um, so it was a big deal um, compared to what had been a three-week gap in communications. Now it was instant. Getting back to the boys in the submarine. They were down there. When the, when the tow rope broke and they began to plummet, instantly they turned off all the electricity. The... Uh, braced themselves and they released a massive ballast that they had and um, that was released but they still obviously fell there was a ton of water in the rear of the of the submarine when they hit the sea floor it's estimated they were doing about 40 miles an hour it's about 65 kilometers an hour then they checked themselves there was no leaks there was some hissing turned out to be from their oxygen tank they were able to shut that off they uh they seemed to be in reasonably good shape. Um, luckily, Roger Chapman had been working before he went down on that shift. Uh, that shift. He spent the whole previous day working on repairing the equipment, the arms at the front of the submarine. And as part of that, he had actually put in a fresh new full bottle of oxygen, which uh, made a big difference. Had he not done that, uh, they'd have been much worse off. This gave them several days, um, so they uh, they were they were hopeful that they'd be be rescued. They did have some communication with the surface. Um, I've been unable to establish exactly what nature of radio communication they had. I'm t I read it was radio. Um, anyway, I didn't think a radio would have worked that easily. But they did they did have some communication with the surface. As soon as this happened and it was realized they were still alive, wheels began to turn and there was a big multinational effort came together to try and get help for these guys. Um, there was other, this, was, this, this submersible was called the Pisces 3. There was the Pisces 2 that was working in the North Sea. So that was immediately recalled and Pisces 5 was in Canada and these submersibles were all designed by a Canadian company. So uh, they were all flown to Cork and um, took a few days to get there. There was an American uh, recovery vehicle called the CURV. 
I don't know, do they actually pronounce it curve or do they call it C-U-R-V? I'll call it C-U-R-V. C -U -R -V. <coughs> and uh, that was also flown uh, to Cork. They had one sandwich and plenty of water. They had about 80 hours worth of oxygen left in the thing. Like the guys in Apollo 13, it wasn't just the oxygen was the problem. It was the fact that they were breathing out CO2. So they had a scrubber on board that would take the CO2 out of the air, but they had to be really careful about using it. They wanted to make this last. So they would use it intermittently. Um, they got themselves up high. The, the submarine was inverted. They, they had to climb up to an area where they could perch and they knew the CO2 was heavier than air and that would gather in the bottom. Um, they were down there in the darkness, in the cold, and they were waiting. And people above were manoeuvring aircraft and ships and other submersibles to try and get to them. Now, going back to the cables, this cable that they had got across the, uh, the Atlantic, this 1958 cable that they got across lasted it wasn't great. It took them a whole day to get Queen Victoria's message across because there's a huge voltage drop if you're going from A to B through a, a small, tiny copper wire across 1600 miles. There's a massive voltage drop and there's also the problem of capacitance. So the way the telegraph works is uh, you have a single, co single copper wire Sus not insulated, suspended on poles with little insulated holders every now and again. You have a switch at this end. Current will flow through the copper wire, through a coil at the other end, and return through the ground and back. That completes the circuit. So as you make this switch, make and break this switch, your coil, the coil at the receiving side, will energize and pull in a little armature that will click and with Morse code which was what was adopted short push of the key here makes two short clicks there and the longer gap between the clicks for a, a dash dot and a dash and between the dots and dashes that's how the whole thing was done and the receivers would their ears get attuned to it and before long they could do it mechanically so that you could mechanically send stuff and mechanically record on paper the messages and that could be done much faster because they could be read afterwards rather than being read live but voltage drop was the problem you start off with so many volts here and it's reduced by the time the resistance of all the copper has accumulated and had an effect for long runs like across america or across europe or across countries you would have to have a a position where instead of instead of just clicking your armature would actually close another circuit that would cause that signal to be carried on so your switch here would be mimicked by a switch that was activated by the coil at the receiving station and because when they had uh, coach lines with, with horses that they would change and these were called relay stations this was called a relay station for the telegraph and that's why the word relay is used now for such an arrangement where you have a coil that would make a switch then as it operates and um, the voltage drop was overcome by relay stations. You can't do relay stations under the sea, obviously. So there was going to be a massive voltage drop as the cable ran across the ocean. The other problem with the cable was capacitance. Now, electrical capacitance uh, occurs when if you have a, an electrical charge, say something that, that is positive and something that is negative, and they're very close, but there's a, a something that's be between them that's not a conductor, doesn't conduct. These two, these two electrical charges, but basically that, that forms a capacitor that will, will store a charge like a very short-term battery. So um, it's used for all kinds of things in electrical circuits, but one of the things a capacitor is used for, and uh, one of the effects of capacitance, this idea of having two charges close together but not quite touching is that that will store a charge very briefly but enough to make an effect and if you had if you're if you're trying to turn ac into dc for example you have your mains voltage 
you step it down with a transformer so you have a smaller mains voltage you use a bridge rectifier that will uh, four diodes configured in such a way that the voltage will uh, the current will only flow out of it in one way no matter which way it's flowing in so that will turn your ac into direct current in other words it's only flowing one way but it's mimicking the waves of the ac applying a, a capacitor across that turns those waves into a much smoother output of voltage now that's when you want it to be smoothed if you are trying to signal people and you are applying changes to electricity kept the effect of capacitance is going to slow down those changes and if you change the changes are too quick together then they'll blur into one another and so there's a point at which it becomes impossible to make out the messages with this undersea cable they were using the copper core to transmit their uh, their current the return path was the outer sheath that they had for protection the capacitance between the two was a big problem and um, these two things one positive one negative effectively or, or other way around um, was the issue because they didn't use uh, the same kind of uh, voltage and lack of voltage as the way of indicating their pulses on this telegraphic cable underwater telegraphic cable what they did was for a dot they went the voltage went one way for a dash they reversed the voltage and it went the other way and they had because they were dealing with such tiny amounts at the other end they had a galvanometer which is basically an arrangement of coils and when the voltage is applied to a coil in between that that coil creates a magnetic field and that will twist a little plate on a spindle in between the coils that's how they were trying to determine what the person at the other end in at the other side of the ocean was trying to do and trying to interpret those signals now they did later on develop um it was a guy who went on to become lord kelvin he created this uh, this mirror galvanometer which had a little mirror on the plate that moved and that then cast a beam of light reflected beam of light over a much bigger range it was much easier to tell then what what was trying to happen with the signal or which way the thing was turning so this first cable had been a disaster and um, it had taken all day to get queen victoria's message across to the president and um, hours and um, people weren't really sure where they're getting it where they they weren't getting the acknowledgements and um, there was a lot of rivalry then at the time as well between between kelvin and um, a guy called white house who insisted that they should be using not galvanometers but the actual paper tape type equipment that was used um, on normal um, terrestrial uh, telegraphic systems um, in fact the acknowledgement that Queen Victoria's message had gone across didn't come back until Kelvin was actually able to put his galvanometer on and read it the White House hadn't been able to read it at all White House got the bright idea then of increasing the voltage to try and get messages across and he put it up from 600 to 2000 volts and burned out the cable somewhere along the cable there was a weak point and basically burned it out made the cable unusable it lasted three weeks uh, there was consternation everybody said that uh, the whole thing was a sham that it was a con and um, Cyrus Field was being demonized and told he was a con man uh, Western Union were going nah, 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 nah. Um, they were still trying to get their cable across Siberia um, they got Alaska was no problem trees loads of trees they could be used for telegraph poles no problem and um, they got across this, the Bering Sea but on the Siberian side they were having trouble with poles it was bare there was barren the they didn't have trees to chop down and make telegraph poles from so they were struggling so what happened was the idea had been proven that it could work the possibility was there got more investors the governments were still behind them and what became available was the Great Eastern the massive ship that had been built that wasn't really performing economically the way people had thought um, it, economically it had been a, a bad job but from a point of view uh, had a lot of bad luck as well 
but um, from the point of view of a ship it was ideal they could put masses of cable on it um, and they made masses of cable they put it on this ship I think it was about 2,600 miles of cable they made um, and they started paying this out from Valencia they were about 600 miles short of Newfoundland when they lost this cable they went back and they started again and in uh, 1866 they completed the cable once again the two continents were united 1866 um, they actually after they brought that cable across and by the way they brought it in from Valencia in Ireland Knightstown where they have a museum there now all about this they brought it across to a place in Newfoundland with probably the world's the world's best place name Hearts Content and in Hearts Content they brought it ashore and they went back out to sea for a few months and spent time grappling for the lost end of the cable that they lost the previous year in 1865 and they found it and they spliced it and they paid out new cable and they made brought that into Hearts Content as well so you had two cables linking the two continents the capacitance problems were still there they could do about eight words a minute I think they were charging a dollar 25 per word they couldn't get any faster and it became impossible to read um, much later on um, when Marconi got radio working and he set up um, a Marconi transmission station in Ireland that would broadcast to Newfoundland he was able what featured in the whole what factored into it for him was he was able to transmit faster he'd no capacitance to worry about in the air so he was able to transmit much faster and could offer cheaper rate uh, for cables and compete um, economically with the undersea cable because of that now back to the two lads stuck 150 miles off cork on the seabed um, the first ship that got to them to, got there to help was the uh, Sir Tristram um, one of the fleet Royal Fleet Auxiliary vessels and the communications team that were in touch with uh, Pisces 3 on the ocean floor the two Rogers they that communication team transferred over um, onto the Sir Tristram while the Voyager went to Cork to pick up the submersibles that were being flown in I couldn't find out exactly what communication method they were using to talk to the two lads below. Um, one source said radio. Um, I didn't think radio worked that well underwater, but maybe it was. Um, or maybe it was some kind of telephony line that they, they still had in place. I don't know. This was, uh, this was before the airplane movie. Um, if it wasn't, I'm sure they could have had some crack with two guys called Roger at the end of the line. Um, Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Maybe they wouldn't have seen the funny side. Uh, well, no, I'd have been tempted. Um, now, uh, Pisces 2, Pisces 5 arrived in Cork. They were loaded on Voyager. Vickers Voyager headed back to the site. The Indian Coast Guard ship John Cabot turned up to collect the uh, CURV that the Yanks had sent. John Cabot couldn't get in because of the tides so they had to put there was a first problem facing the curve was they had to put that onto a barge to get it out of Cork down to the John Cabot then she took it down and um, she arrived about a, a day behind the rest and um, they had lo been lost on Wednesday at 9 30 in the morning and um, I believe and uh, it was Friday in the early hours of Friday morning about two o'clock that Pisces 2 was put in the water took hours took an hour or so to get down um yeah an hour i think to get down and find locate pisces 3 um was able to attach a line but not much of a line uh to the uh, propeller guard or something um and went back to the surface pisces 5 went into the water um pisces 5 couldn't find the pisces 3 one of the reasons was there was press had hired trawlers trawlers were surrounding the site and the sonar that they were using to try and locate Pisces 3 was being disrupted by the propellers and the engines of the uh, the trawlers 
press boats. So when John Cabot turned up, one of her first jobs was to uh, get rid of the press boats. Um, then they went to put the curve in the water. Now the weather was getting up. Okay, you had uh, winds gusting up to up to fifty knots. You had uh, twenty foot waves. Um, this this wasn't looking good. John Cabot took water on board that damaged the big 50 pin connector 50 that they, they were using to talk to the connect to the curve CURV um, so they had to repair this 50 pin connector on board which which wasn't easy um, there was also damage to a gyro system that meant their compass wasn't working so what they did was because uh, the, the CURV was a remotely manned thing um, not remotely manned but unmanned remotely controlled um, so they had no gyro for the compass so what they did was they got a diver's wrist compass and they strapped that to the part of the chassis that they could see with one of their cameras and they used that so they put the CORV in the water. Now Pisces 2 had got down and got a better, a special toggle that had been sent that uh, they were able to get down and fix that. Um, the CORV went down with a toggle that was designed to basically, they could place it into the open hatch. As I said, there was the, the sphere, the rear sphere that had flooded and there was the, the compartment sphere where the, the crew sphere, the hatch was open in the rear sphere they were able to get down and um, again took about an hour to get down and find them and put this in and then I think it took uh, I took about two hours to get get them to the surface now it's important to note that during this lift the CURV cables we got got entangled in the lifting cables and so the CURV basically had to be cut loose to ensure the, the safe lift of the uh, Pisces 3 so it was lost. When they finally got them to the surface, it took a half an hour to open the hatch. They were groggy, they were weak, they'd been cooped up 80 hours they'd spent in that thing and uh, they were taken out. Um, they had 20 minutes of air left. So it was a close call. And yet, if you see the interview they did when they walk across the tarmac of Cork Airport after getting out of the helicopter, um, it's well worth checking out. If you search uh, YouTube for Pisces 3, you'll find it. Now, you know, the English are phlegmatic, yeah, stiff upper lip, um, imperturbable. As they were, um, everybody's getting more like the Yanks these days, more emotive and, you know, weepy and emotional and all that. Um, but these guys walking across the tarmac are being interviewed you should check it out uh, all in the day's work uh, no big deal we're fine uh, could you tell us what conditions were like down there oh they were very pleasant very quiet very, very <laughs> um, and it turns out that the uh, the telegram the message they got from from queen elizabeth uh wasn't from queen elizabeth it was from the qe2 uh, a bit of a mistake was made in, in that somewhere um queen elizabeth ii was the ship um, now, that's the story. The two Rogers, they both stayed in the business. Um, one stayed with that company, one left, set up his own rescue company and was one of the people offering to help the Kursk when that went down. Um, I hope you enjoyed that story. I hope you enjoyed that bit of insight into uh, transatlantic cables. And uh, maybe you'll see you again. Bye now. Mind yourselves. <laughs>